Добрый день, уважаемые дамы и господа. Добрый день. Меня зовут Сергей Сапегин, я директор научно-технического центра психиатрии. Мне приятно начать нашу курсу на тему опыт Северной Америки и реализации проекта по освоению нетрадиционного газа. That is a target uh, to discuss the experience of Northern America and the implementation of the project uh, to develop the unconventional guests. Uh, our guests uh, are soon to join us. And uh, now we will open the floor for the discussion. Thank you very much to everybody who answered our initiative and has taken a decision to take part in our round table, uh, our guests, um, and the um, uh, people who uh, will be uh, watching us uh, online on the terminal website. Uh, a couple of uh, months ago, during the similar round table, the senior expert of the International Energy Agency, Pavel Olyevnik from Poland, stressed that the golden rules of the golden age of the natural gas called the production company to abide by the principle of efficient planning, full transparency, monitoring of the environment, ensuring a high level of ecological safety, and constructive dialogue with all of the stakeholders. His, this statement of his has set the topics for our future round tables. Ukrainian experts have also presented their vision of the problems related to development of unconventional hydrocarbons in Ukraine. This and other issues that have been discussed by the experts during the previous three round tables have been summarized in the book that has recently been published. Uh, modern issues of the state policy in uh, the area of uh, development of uh, non-traditional hydrocarbons in Ukraine, which has been uh, developed and published by our center. Uh, you can uh, look at it uh, content uh, at the uh, site of uh, Terminal Journal published by our center. In this book, you will find an analytical report of uh, the uh, technical and the scientific center in Psyche on the state of art and the future of the production of oil and gas from unconditional sources. I am pleased uh, that today we will host, unfortunately not everybody has arrived, but we are waiting by uh, some of our experts uh, who are no uh, less uh, and uh, uh, or maybe even more experienced in certain issues. Uh, so these experts are Krista Johnson, Director um, for State Government uh, Relations uh, Department uh, of the Eastern East Central Region of the U.S. Shell Company, John Hines, a Governmental Relations Advisor of the Eastern Central Region of the U.S. of the Shell Company. We do understand why they are late. Both Krista and John have arrived at Ukraine for only one day, and we are happy that they have found some time to take part in the activities of the round table. Uh, also, Roman Abimach, the coordinator of the uh, coordinating uh, center to implement economic reforms uh, uh, at the president of uh, Ukraine, is taking part of uh, in our discussion. We have uh, known Roman for uh, quite a while, and his flexible mind and uh, uh, encyclopedic knowledge make it possible to shape correct recommendation to the government uh, in regards uh, to uh, production of uh, unconventional. Uh, carbon hydrates. Um, also, one of the authors of uh, the book that I have already mentioned is present here. Uh, this is uh, Mikhail Gonchalov. He is the president of the Center for Global Studies Strategy 21, the director of the energy programs of the NOMAS Center. Uh, he is an active participant of uh, numerous discussions, conferences, and round tables. Besides, uh, we have uh, just been joined by Andrei Balula, leading engineer of the state company Chernomola Nifty who 
uh, is an expert um, in the issues uh, to be uh, discussed uh, today. I would also like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, after the round table, uh, table uh, the uh, record uh, in uh, English and uh, Russian will be prepared and uh, published at our website. Uh, besides, uh, the analytical materials of uh, our analytical round table experience uh, of the Northern America, America in implementation uh, of the project to develop unconventional gas will be published in the recent uh, issue of uh, the journal uh, terminal dedicated to uh, oil related issues. So what we are going to do now, we are going to listen to uh, three presentations, uh, and uh, then we uh, we will open floor for questions and answers. Uh, we uh, have uh, two and a half hours. I expect that this time will be sufficient, and I, as a moderator, hope that uh, our uh, uh, listeners and viewers uh, will not uh, object uh, as being quite relaxed and. Uh, uh, comfortable and we hope that our viewers and listeners will also uh, make themselves uh, comfortable uh, my request to the journalists and guests uh, to pose questions to the pre speakers after we uh, complete all the uh, key note speeches uh, I would also re re like to request you uh, to turn off your cell phones uh, and not to, to use uh, them due uh, to a difficult, complicated technical system that we have installed. And so uh, now I would like uh, to give the floor uh, to uh, Roman Abimach. I will uh, briefly describe the oil and gas uh, market in Ukraine. In the year 2012, uh, Ukraine uh, consumed uh, 25 billion cubic meters of gas of them. Uh, one third was uh, produced um, in Ukraine. Um, the rest was exported mainly from Russia. Internal uh, consumption is uh, covered by the regulated uh, sector. Uh, it uh, covers uh, mostly households uh, and household consumption. The rest is uh, covered uh, by import. Uh, and uh, as you can see, that uh, industry or production experiences significant uh, growth of uh, prices during the uh, last uh, uh, three years, beginning with the year 2010 till 2013. Um, and this uh, slide, uh, you can see the fact that Ukraine uh, has a uh, quite powerful gas transport system uh, with um, the total um, capacity of uh, 301 million cubic meters a year. The volumes of uh, transport of gas and uh, 2012 uh, total to 133 million uh, of them uh, approximately 30 percent were consumed by uh, Ukraine 60 were exported uh, the so-called transit gas uh, free uh, access uh, to the gas transport system is regulated by the law, and this access is provided to all the interested suppliers. A couple of uh, words uh, on the beginning of a production. Uh, of um, hydrocarbons in Ukraine, we could see that the commercial uh, production uh, started uh, in the 1950s, the uh, peak was uh, in the 1970s, and the production level stabilized in the 1990s, uh, 20 billion for oil and for condensate and uh, for gas and oil and condensate is 3 million years a, ye a year. In accordance uh, with the information of the International Energy Agency, Ukraine is the top one 
uh, country in the world which uh, initiated uh, export of uh, gas abroad. Uh, uh, which occurred in 1945, and the uh, country uh, of expert was Poland. And now I'm going to uh, say a couple of words about the resource potential of our state, uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, the um, regulatory framework. Uh, we can see that uh, Ukraine has uh, quite a good uh, potential in accordance with the conventional gas, uh, gas from conventional uh, sources. Uh, the gas uh, deposits uh, total to one uh, trillion, while the resource uh, component is approximately five uh, trillion of cubic meters of uh, gas. Uh, today's uh, level uh, of uh, consumption uh, demonstrates uh, that this uh, uh, level of uh, deposits will uh, total to 50 years. Uh, this is one of the highest indicators uh, worldwide. Besides, uh, Ukraine has uh, unconventional gas, gas from unconventional sources. Uh, you are all aware of it, that's shale gas, uh, um, methane, um, Gas and deep shelf gas. According to different sources, it deposits to approximately trillions of cubic meters. It is necessary to point that these deposits are risky deposits, and we need to divide them by a lot. Uh, and that would make it possible for us uh, to see what is the uh, commercial outcome of these uh, deposits. Uh, scientifically proven uh, uh, deposits are located at uh, the uh, deposit located uh, 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 at the deposit experiencing um, decreased uh, production. Um, they are either uh, exhausted deposits. So uh, these are the uh, deposits that are difficult to extract. As I have indicated, um, unconventional deposits are also hard to extract. Uh, in a certain aspects, they are even more difficult to extract uh, than the uh, conventional uh, gas. Uh, what uh, uh, about forecasts, uh, depos production forecasts? We have two scenarios. One is a pessimistic that Ukraine by the year 2030 will produce approximately 30 million cubic meters a year, and the optimistic uh, that Ukraine will be able to produce up to 65 cubic million uh, million of cubic meters of gas. Um, there are uh, prerequisites uh, for both. Uh, uh, scenarios uh, uh, to ensure the optimistic investment should total to uh, 10 uh, billion uh, dollars uh, in total. So the investments should uh, grow five times, uh, uh, both in extraction and uh, uh, scientific inquiry. As for the regulatory framework, we have two key modes. No, I am going to begin with the laws. Everything that is related with land use beginning with the year 2013 will be regulated by the renewed a code on uh, land uh, use. Uh, the uh, corresponding uh, law has uh, been recently adopted uh, by uh, the uh, law. As uh, for uh, the uh, taxes, it is all covered by uh, the uh, tax code. As uh, for res mineral resources, it is covered by uh, the law on uh, land resources. All issues related to environment are covered by the environmental legislation, especially the law on protection of the environment, and so on. The uh, so-called mode of uh, joint activities is regulated by a separate law in itself. So, uh, when we uh, talk uh, about uh, um, subsurface resource management, uh, we have uh, the uh, traditional approaches uh, to that issue. 
I'm sorry there are some technical issues with the presentation, but I will continue talking. So the, the traditional uh, subsurface resource uh, management uh, uh, is uh, regulated by uh, a provision of uh, special uh, permits. Uh, after the uh, special law will be adopted, uh, we think uh, uh, tenders will be organized to do that, and the special uh, permits uh, will uh, be covered uh, by the laws on the subsurface resource management. Uh, also, um, uh, we are going to uh, also talk about uh, production sharing. At that, both of these uh, modes uh, uh, will be uh, widely used. Uh, the subsurface resource management will be based on tenders organized by the state, and uh, the uh, winner will be the company that has offered the most interesting proposals to the state. So uh, we believe uh, uh, that uh, uh, we uh, plan uh, to avoid basing the tenders only on one indicators, uh, which is the uh, maximum price, uh, but um, uh, we are thinking about adding uh, additional requirements uh, such as uh, the development program uh, offered by the investor. Please go back to the previous slide. And uh, the uh, local and regional uh, aspects, various uh, social uh, programs um, that uh, the applicants can offer to the current region. So, uh, now uh, let's uh, take a look at the permit permits uh, to be issued. I am going to call them licenses. Um, there are the following types of licensing, three actually. Uh, type one is exploration uh, with um, um, a pre-drilling uh, pre um, uh, extraction, uh, five to uh, ten years, uh, depending uh, on uh, a type of uh, um, uh, well, the uh, second type of license is actual uh, development, 20 to 30 years. Um, and the uh, period will also depend uh, on actual uh, placement of the deposit. And the third type of the uh, license is the combined mixed uh, license, uh, which includes both the uh, geological exploration and automatic development. Uh, it uh, will uh, be provided for a period of 25 to 40 years, depending on the location of the deposit. At that, uh, uh, Using uh, the second type uh, license, uh, the, the, uh, when we talk about the uh, PCA uh, mode, uh, we will then have licenses uh, issued for a period of uh, 50 years. And um, that we need to remember that uh, for non-traditional, unconventional hydrocarbons uh, on land and in sea, uh, this will not take place. So we will not have any uh, limitation in regards to size of uh, the uh, site. And now let's move on to the next slide, um, describing the tax system as it is regulated today in Ukraine. Again, we can see two different uh, modes uh, of uh, subs uh, subsurface resource management uh, upon which uh, the legal system uh, uh, depends. So um, the first uh, uh, law is corporate tax, 16%, uh, uh, beginning with the year 2014. Uh, the uh, royalty uh, varies in Ukraine when we talk about uh, conventional uh, development. We are uh, we will see that it will total uh, to 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 39 percent. Uh, 
Uh, what does it depend on? It depends on the uh, type of the resource, whether it is oil and or get some depth of uh, um, well, whether it is 5,000 kilometers or 5,000 meters or uh, over 5,000 meters uh, consumption uh, category. Uh, whether it is uh, the uh, household consumption or the commercial uh, sector. Um, royalty uh, for, uh, or, or, I guess, and content set totals uh, to 17 to 39 uh, percent. Uh, for gas, um, it totals to 11 to 25 percent of the price of imported gas in Ukraine. Um, uh, PSA is uh, covered by uh, certain uh, benefits. Uh, it's uh, two uh, percent for oil, and that um, we needed to keep in mind uh, that um, uh, investors uh, they uh, share uh, interests with the state. It uh, shares uh, uh, its profits with the state, uh, and that uh, the tax uh, code. Uh, has adopted a special um, procedure uh, regarding the preferential um, taxation of uh, difficult to develop uh, uh, resources, uh, which provides uh, a 2% uh, percent, uh, uh, tax. Uh, the resources should be uh, exhausted. Uh, exhausted. Uh, there is a whole range of uh, criteria included there. Uh, their list will be uh, published in the nearest future for everybody to take a look at it. Um, let's take a look at the next slide. We will see that Ukraine, compared to other countries, um, is um, quite favorable in, in, in regards to taxation. Uh, the um, highest um, taxation rate uh, when we talk about SRP is 18 percent. When we talk about uh, traditional development, uh, the maximum uh, rate is 55 percent, which is compatible with, with, for instance, Romania or uh, Poland, uh, our neighboring countries. Uh, and that uh, I would like uh, to clarify. Uh, Norway and uh, uh, the Netherlands uh, the plate, uh, do not have uh, PSA uh, regimes uh, and they have quite high uh, tax uh, rate, but that uh, tax rate is uh, collected uh, as a corporate tax. So in, in our case, 55% is a tax collected from actual profits. Um, the practical uh, changes um, in our uh, legal framework are as follows. Uh, we can say that during the last uh, two years, uh, uh, the uh, special agreement with uh, Shell uh, has been assigned a uh, an agreement with Chevron has also been assigned. ENI Italian company has also um, started working on shale gas. Uh, in the nearest future, we expect uh, to assign with uh, Exxon model and with the uh, consortium uh, uh, involving INVF, a French uh, company. Um, at the kind of current moment, it has also regulated all of the disputable uh, issues related uh, to um, the Kerch uh, area and uh, is looking for the partners uh, that would assist them in the development of uh, such a significant deposit. The next slide, please. I would also like to stress um, that uh, PSA uh, mode, uh, most of these companies use uh, this mode, PSA mode. It is more attractive to the investors compared to the traditional uh, mode. It uh, brings a certain uh, advantages, uh, including the uh, stabilizing uh, clause. Uh, it, uh, it includes a, a, a special amortization, it uh, um, reduces expert tax and uh, um, VAT on import of certain categories of equipment and does not include various expert quotas or other restrictions. So we all understand very well that there will be more PSA-based agreements made 
in future, but uh, there will be a limited number of them, maybe one or two, three at maximum. Um, other and um, other companies will be working on the base of a traditional mode. And the new uh, code on subsurface resource management uh, is a suggestion suggesting uh, such uh, improvements. What these improvements will be dealing with? First, uh, the principle itself, uh, the principle of codification, the renewed uh, code on subsurface resource management, uh, it, inclu it will include uh, four uh, laws and bylaws. Uh, it uh, will uh, provide uh, 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 possibilities for uh, assignment of various assets, and it will also make it possible to develop deposits through various mortgage procedures. And, um, it includes uh, such uh, provisions uh, uh, as the exhaust, exhausting uh, list of reasons to annul licenses or permits and provides guarantees uh, that uh, for a successful uh, discovery of the resources, the investor at the stage of uh, geological uh, discovery will receive automatically the right to develop uh, these resources and will uh, have his permit automatically reviewed. Uh, also, the, this code will include improved uh, formula for um, cost calculation. Um, it uh, will uh, also include uh, such uh, notions uh, as the types of uh, deposits, complexity of extraction. It will uh, also include uh, such uh, issues uh, as uh, unconventional, non-conventional extraction uh, size uh, that was uh, surveyed. And there will be no limits uh, of, uh, of uh, site size for non-conventional uh, development. Um, uh, we will also, this um, code will also take into consideration stages of uh, projects and so on. Uh, the, uh, the time to submit application will be uh, doubled and uh, approxim at least one month will be provided to prepare the uh, package of documents for the applicants. Another important issue that I have pointed to um, through harmonization with the European uh, legislation, we have uh, uh, included a right uh, uh, to uh, use uh, uh, best uh, offer uh, in regards to a series uh, of criteria instead of a uh, best uh, price um, uh, tender, which I have already talked about, uh, including social uh, programs and so on. At that, uh, the weight of the um, social um, uh, program is going to be uh, one of uh, the most important. Um. So I would like to round up uh, my very detailed uh, presentation by uh, indicating that uh, in Ukraine, area of uh, uh, development is uh, quite well regulated. And nevertheless, uh, it uh, should be uh, further uh, improved. It requires uh, further amendments. Uh, and we are always um, grateful uh, for um, uh, our foreign uh, colleagues uh, to share their experience, uh, and uh, we appreciate uh, uh, their experience. Thank you very much, Nagaman. Uh, I believe that during the last uh, year, when we uh, talk um, about um, updating uh, our uh, legal uh, framework uh, resulted in a significant uh, uh, changes in our uh, legislation. And uh, now I would like uh, uh, to give a uh, floor to our guest, uh, to John Hines. The presentation prepared, I want to thank you for this opportunity. Yes, and just um, my name is John Hines, and I am a government relations advisor to Shell. Yes, and I focus on the areas of Pennsylvania, 
вопросами, связанными с Пенсильванией. Нью-Йорк. And Ohio. And that's an area we call Appalachia in the United States. So I'm going to uh, give you an overview of Pennsylvania's regulatory program in the process we went through over the last few years in, in the state as we dealt with the unconventional play. Here we have a map of the United States in the various shell plays throughout the country. If, if you note on the map, I will focus on Appalachia, where Shell does business, and we started in the year 2010. Shell's position in Appalachia, we have approximately 850,000 acres of land in the state of Pennsylvania. We employ about 350 people across the state, and our current focus are those three areas in the map, which would be Tioga County, Pennsylvania, in the north central portion, the Bradford area, and Slippery Rock. The key of uh, my focus of my presentation is to talk about how we work with the regulatory programs in the state and really how the state developed its various programs in order to manage unconventional drilling. Basically what we do is we work with the regulated community as they develop uh, their programs and provide a lot of technical assistance in moving forward to really elevate the bar um, and for best management practice and such for the play. The other thing that we do as Shell, we try to ensure that our operating principles are set in our programs and are implemented on the ground and they are integrated uh, with our partners in government. So let's move on. Let's move on to Pennsylvania's story. Ah, very good, thank you. Yeah. This might make it better and I will slow down a bit. <laughs> Let's talk about Pennsylvania's story. Here we have uh, a graph of well drilling in Pennsylvania, unconventional well drilling. And as you can see in the year 2005, the state issued eight permits for the unconventional play or the Marcella Shell play. As you can see, 2005 and 2006, it grew to 36 permits. I'll jump to 2008, 335, to the peak of the permits we issued in 2011, which were over 1,972 throughout the state of Pennsylvania. So you can see in that time frame how quickly the development and exploration accelerated. Now, why is that important? because at the same time we had to take a look at the regulatory regime within Pennsylvania, the existing laws, the existing programs, and curtail those or change those programs in order to help us manage unconventionals. A little story of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has been drilling in the, the conventional drilling since the mid-1850s and through the 1950s through the 80s we had a lot of conventional drilling. So the state was very used to dealing with the in industry. The difference was the magnitude of scale as the unconventional play began to unfold. So the question that regulators, and I was a regulator at that time, we had to ask ourselves were, what tools do we have? Do we need to stop everything, where many places look at a, a moratorium, or do we take the tools we have and begin to channel those tools to deal with our current situation? So let's move to the next slide. In dealing with the unconventional or looking at our regulatory framework, we try to simply put things into four key categories. One, 
Safety. Safety really in the context of a regulatory program in the state in which I deal with is looking at well construction and particularly emergency planning. So, safety. Second is health. Looking at the public health across the board, there's two key areas that we focused on. One was water disposal and the second was air quality. So as we were evaluating our programs, we put each one of those to that criteria. The third was the environment. And I, we use the term erosion and sediment control, and that's really in, in the state of Pennsylvania how you manage stormwater. Water coming on a site, how do you basically keep the sediment and um, erosion from moving into our streams? And just to put things in context, in the state of Pennsylvania, we have over, over 83,000 miles of streams throughout the Commonwealth. So just about anywhere you go, you are near a stream or a river. And water resources in the state of Pennsylvania is one of our primary areas or, or, or resources that we protect because we understand that it is an economic driver for the future. So there's a high level of scrutiny on anything that impacts water within the state. And then the third and some or fourth that we often don't think about is the administrative aspect of a regulatory program. You think about the conditions on the ground, but you really have to focus on how you are going to administer, how the reporting is going to come in. Um, so for example, I have our waste and production reports. How do you manage that information flow um, in order to help you continue to make decisions or know that you're at a point? So we put the regulatory framework through those four key areas. Pennsylvania has some of the most stringent laws in the country. Uh, our Clean Streams Law was a model actually for the federal programs in, in the country in developing how we protect water. So we were, had all these tools of programs across the board. Now we put all those tools under an umbrella of the uh, 2012 Oil and Gas Act and I'll talk about that in a moment but I just want to give you uh, a feel for what was on the books in 2005 when the play began and then how we had to move those ahead to, to change them. First was the oil and conservation law which was actually developed in 1954 and it was a, a law across the state on how we dealt with conventional drilling particularly on the mechanical elements of, of any drilling that take place. The second of which I talked about was um, the Clean Streams Law. Again, a very, very broad law dealing with how we manage water resources. And I just broke that down so you could get a feel for what that law does. We deal with basically general provisions, setting water quality standards, um, talking about how we deal with wastewater treatment plants. And the reason I put that in there, because that is something I want to touch upon as an example of what we dealt with on, on flow back and production water going to wastewater treatment plants. And then finally is um, the erosion and sediment control, dealing with storm water. When water gets on a site, how do you contain that water to keep it on the site and control it? So again, point being is that we were not uh, unfamiliar with managing conventional, it was looking at the existing programs. A couple more, I'll go quickly. Uh, Dam Safety and Encroachment Act is basically, uh, we use that law to develop pits and impoundments, um, how you contain water. It, the Water Resources Planning Act, and I note that because the Water Resources Planning Act, or Act 220 as we refer to it, helped us develop a mechanism in order to track water from the time it's withdrawn from an area to the time it's discharged. Something very important to us in the state. And then a couple others, the Solid Waste Management Act, Air Pollution Act, and the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Act. Uh, in the state of Pennsylvania, all labs have to be accredited by the state, whether it is a public lab or a private lab. As you can see, I kind of laid the platform of the laws and regulations across the land. Again, the question was, how do we take these existing programs and begin to modify them in order to manage unconventionals without taking the step that some had taken was stopping everything? So we had to take about a nine-month period, 
very short window of time frame and take a look at all our existing programs and begin to channel those programs to manage the unconventional play. In addition, we worked with some community groups and others to take a look at the programs as a whole, and really it was a mechanism of how we could reform what we were doing in the state. So we had a number of meetings as we were working within the regulatory agency. We were also ascertaining information from others. So the end result was we did two things. We developed a program that managed the unconventionals, small tweakings on, on our various programs. And I will give you an example. One of the, the issues that were going on in the state of Pennsylvania because of the high volumes of water was how to manage the flow back in production water. We had existing programs in place, but we really had to channel the regulatory regime because the following was taking place. Uh, when the unconventional play began, some of our municipal systems, our, low, our localist form of government, managed wastewater going into streams. Those wastewater treatment plants were taking flow back and production water and channeling it through their system and discharging it. The concern from those of us in the regulatory world was the impact on the sewage treatment plant or damaging it so it uh, would not be able to do what it was intended to do. So we had to quickly make a change in a regulation to set a new standard to stop discharge of flow back and production water to wastewater treatment plants. And we did that and normally in the state it would take 18 months to two years to do a regulation. We were able to do that in about a 10 month period. Um, we buckled down our hats, put our creativity uh, to the test, and basically what we did was set a standard. Um, for total dissolved solids, which are the constituents in the flow back and production water. But the importance of this, we worked with the industry, we worked with the environmental community, and we did not set a prescriptive framework, we set a bar. We said that you cannot discharge um, flow back and production water that meets a 500 milligram per standard for total dissolved solids. So we set the bar but it allowed the industry to respond to that bar and begin basically uh, developing new technologies for recycling the flow back and production water, um, finding alternative discharge or, or disposal mechanisms. But the key for us was we went from a point of no recycling and reuse to about a plus 70 percent now across the industry. So. Being creative in the regulatory program, we were able to, one, create a different market uh, for recycling and reuse. Two, we were able to deal with a, an issue quickly that channeled our efforts from discharging to a stream to be creating something productive. So I wanted to focus on that uh, particular uh, uh, point. Um, the other uh, aspect was we developed an Umbrella Act, Act 13 of 2002, or the New Oil and Gas Act. And again, it was done in a somewhat of a short order, and it really took our existing programs and helped channel those to set a higher bar in what we wanted to do in Pennsylvania. Now, regulations are always changing. We know that. So some of the current issues in Pennsylvania are dealing with public resource protection. Um, the public lands, how do you manage some of the aesthetic pieces. Second is well drilling. I made the point earlier that Pennsylvania um, has been drilling well since the mid-1800s. One of the issues that we are dealing with now within the state are identifying abandoned wells that were done during the conventional times. A lot of those wells during um, World War II, the metal casings were taken out of them. Um, so you, it's a, you have a hard time identifying. So we're setting in Shell, we're working with the state to set a new standard, a new bar, how you do an analysis to ensure that no abandoned wells are in your operational area so you don't have connection between your current drilling and past drilling. Well drilling is another area we're looking at is basically how we can elevate new standards for monitoring and such. And then finally, again, as I started out, the importance of 
water management planning in the state. So we are working on codifying some of the programs that were put in place in the state in managing where you withdraw the water to where you discharge the water. So you want to have that life cycle. Again, it wasn't creating something new. We moved forward and now we're bringing the regulations to meet what's happening. I talked a lot about the regulatory efforts and a way of channeling your existing programs to meet your current needs uh, and not reinventing the wheel, if you will. Another point I would want to make is that any time you are looking at these programs, have your organizational um, development or your administration meet the current demands. The thing that was done in Pennsylvania was that we reorganized our oil and gas program uh, was very small uh, because conventional drilling was really not taking place a lot throughout the state. So changes were made in order to, to meet the demands of the unconventionals. We basically, within the Department of Environmental Protection, created a one-stop shop where oil and gas is being managed in that particular area. It doesn't necessarily mean the regulatory responsibility are taken from other areas, but it is that, that funnel or that channel point to where industry can have that connection or, or issues can be resolved from one organization. It's broken down into two parts. One is planning. So as I often say, we have individuals who are looking ahead to the future of how you create this constant dynamic in order to meet your current needs. And the second is individuals who are looking on the ground at the operations. What's happening currently? How is the state doing their inspections? If someone has a problem, where's that point of contact to go to to help rectify a potential situation on the ground? So those are the key pieces of it. The other part is funding, constant funding of your programs in order to maintain the staff to meet the needs. At that point in time, the state had to be very creative. So we looked at the various, the well permitting programs, what we call clean water fund, and then an impact fee that was done in the state. Now I want to emphasize those are based on fees, not fines and penalties. So a fee now that comes in to support the program goes to help offset the operational cost. That way when production is high, you're able to meet the production level within the regulatory framework or have the people to meet that. And if it, the market drops, you're able to adjust your staff resources accordingly. So those were the key aspects of some of the changes. Now I'll go into some conclusions on lessons learned. Within Pennsylvania, lessons learned. One is transparency of change. In order to build the public's confidence in your existing programs, you have to be very transparent in what you do. Uh, that, that confidence level, they need to know that the regulatory programs that you have in place are being channeled to meet the need. Second is, oftentimes the public debate is healthy. It allows everyone to get their issues on the table, and sometimes great ideas are spawned out of the public debate. The third, which I think is so important, particularly when dealing with the unconventional play, is recognizing that it is a changing dynamic. Technology is often ahead of the regulatory programs, and as regulators, and as a former regulator, we had to learn that oftentimes we want to be overly prescriptive, and that isn't always the way to success. Sometimes technology is ahead of where you are, so you have to allow your programs the flexibility to meet the ever-changing technology, to meet those best management practices that are protective of public health and safety that are current, or more so, than the programs you have in place. Fourth is recognizing there are a variety of efforts. In the state in which I deal with, we have local, state, regional, and federal efforts. But the key is, as I said in the beginning, is having a one point of contact who may not resolve all those problems, but they at least have that understanding of what's going on and can help guide the industry and the community to success. Education, science and the facts. One thing that was impressed upon me as a regulator, science and the facts are the key elements. 
do not react on hearsay, do not react on whatever the sentiment of the day is. It is the technology, it's the science, it's the facts of the basics of our programs. Collaboration and closure. Working with the industry, working with the public, working with the environmental community is key. But there is a point as a regulator where you have to have closure. This is the direction we're going and moving forward. If not, it will be, you will be in a, a step of perpetual planning resources. Ensuring that the resources you have meet the need. And if you don't have the resources, find other ways of embracing what is current. And then finally, flexibility. Knowing that it is an ever-changing dynamic and technology moves often more rapidly than we can have program change, it's the key to rec recognizing a good program is a flexible program. With that, I will stop. I do greatly appreciate the time, um, the opportunity, and I hope when we get into some questions, we'll have further dialogue. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Thank you very much, John. Your presentation was extremely interesting. In my, my opinion, transparency and publicity are the cornerstones that will make it possible for us to move our legal framework forward. Uh, we uh, already we, we do already have uh, some questions to your presentation, but we will open floor for a presentation a little bit later. And now I would like to give floor to Krista for her presentation. Uh, as John described his experience as a state regulator, there are indeed not unlike Ukraine, different levels of government who have different pieces to play in the regulation of the unconventional business. So our federal government has a number of environmental laws that come into play in unconventional gas and uh, oil. Many of those programs are what we call delegated to the states to be implemented. In addition to those programs, the states themselves have programs of their own that are implemented and regulate in the unconventional oil and gas space. We also have local governments who have jurisdiction over certain portions of the unconventional's business. And I'd also like to make a distinction that's important to appreciate about the United States, which is the eastern part of the U.S., where John works, is uh, owned largely both the surface and the minerals by individual people. In the western United States, which was settled later, the federal government retained many of those minerals and owned them and utilized them to the benefit of the citizens of the entire United States. And the surface is owned by private individuals. So a system much more like Ukraine than the eastern part of the United States. And I find when I travel outside of my country, the people have a bit of a different perception of the US. And so I wanted to clarify that for a lot of the portion of the country where this development is taking place, our land ownership system is not unlike other parts of the world. So. This is it. Okay. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. So again, looking at regulation in the US from the company perspective, let me start with Shell's perspective on unconventional development. In all parts of the world, be it Ukraine or the United States, we're guided by a set of onshore operating principles. And those principles are five. One, safety and well integrity. The second is air protection. The third is operational footprint and its reduction. The fourth is water and the protection of groundwater and the reduction of the use of potable water. And finally, communities and engaging with local communities regarding the impacts we may have, both positive and challenging, that result from our operations. 
So as we entered into the unconventional space in the United States, let me say first, as John suggested, in all cases, we came to a very robust set of conventional oil and gas regulations. They were protective of people, they were protective of safety, and they were protective of the environment. What they were not was particularly well-tuned to the pace of the unconventional's business. If you think about drilling unconventional oil and gas like a machine, the machine has to keep running. And in order for that to happen, each of the activities of the machine has to happen in relatively quick succession before the next activity of the machine. This also includes permitting the actions that have to take place in the machine that we call unconventional gas drilling. So I would observe that prior to the year 2008 in the United States, oil and gas regulations occurred. They were robust, but they generally received very little public attention. In 2008, the state of Colorado, where I live, took a first attempt at a fairly sweeping set of reforms to their oil and gas regulations. Those of you who were here around this time last year would have heard from my friend and partner in the unconventional space, uh, David Neslin, who is the former uh, Oil and Gas Conservation Commission director in that state. And he would have described, and I'll share with you as well, a system that took almost 18 months. It involved more than 100 public meetings. It included three or four different drafts. And at the end of all of that process, we came up with a set of new and robust oil and gas regulations that also were fit to adjust to the pace of unconventional gas drilling. We've also discovered, as John suggested, that technology and stakeholder engagement and public attention moves quickly in the unconventional space. And so regulation also needs to move more quickly. So where regulation would be updated every five to 10 years for conventional drilling, in the unconventional space, using Colorado as the example, in 2008, we had a broad set of reform. In 2011, we went back specifically to one aspect, hydraulic fracturing regulation and made some modifications. That process took four months as opposed to 18 months, much quicker. At the same time, the state of Pennsylvania joined in the conversation around unconventional gas regulation. They went through a process that was fit for their purpose, more informal in terms of stakeholder engagement. Their process took a year compared to 18 months in Colorado, slightly less than a year compared to 18 months in Colorado. After the 2011 modification in Colorado, Colorado again in 2012 modified certain aspects of their regulation. We're now in a modification of another part of the regulation. So you see, this regulatory conversation is just that. It is a set of regulatory changes that don't require parliamentary action in this case, congressional action in the case of the United States, or even legislative action at the state level. They're conversations among a group of people, the regulatory community, the regulated community or companies, and our neighbors who live and work and are near to the operations that we're conducting. So why were states able to move more quickly? They became skilled at writing regulations as they gained experience with doing it successfully. They began to coordinate and share information among themselves as regulatory entities, so the Environment Department and the Safety Department and the Well Engineering Departments of these various regulatory agencies began to speak to each other. And that coordination and cooperation allowed them to see needed change quickly, allowed them to act on needed change quickly. And stakeholders, companies, the environmental community, other community voices became efficient with their input into these processes. They became very clear about, as John suggested, 
what was real, what was science and fact-based, and what was concern and, in some cases, to be totally honest, fear based in the unknown. Not based in, in experience, but simply based in not knowing what might be coming. So as they became familiar, and they became able to appreciate and understand in their community what things actually looked like and felt like and smelled like or didn't smell like, they were able to have better articulate their real concerns about the industry. Yeah. So some of the things that we're working on, and I'll describe the pictures in the slides as we go as well, so I, you can see where they're coming from. So protecting water quality, what are some of the key components? Pit lining requirements. So Shell's operating principles say, as we move into a development phase, we will drill with no pits. The regulatory practice is moving toward pitless drilling, but on your way, you will have double barriers. You will line all of your pits, and you will line them with certain sorts of thicknesses of pit liners and, and things of that nature. You'll have not just primary containment, but secondary containment should something get outside of the pit. We've revised spill re reporting requirements twice in Colorado in the last two years so that the volume of report is smaller Less has to be spilled before you have to report. And we've also tightened soil and groundwater standards, meaning how often do you test, when do you test, so before an operation, and then you do your operation, and then after your operation, how many surrounding wells should be tested, and these are all topics for ongoing dialogue and ongoing updates to regulation. This particular picture is a water containment structure in the state of Wyoming, and those are buffalo and buffalo caps. The next topic area in terms of the operating principles and how it ties to regulation is air quality. The practices in the United States are now all moving to a federal standard that we refer to as quad O. And the idea there is to reduce greenhouse gas emission and reduce methane emissions, both from the direct operation as well as anything within the operation that may leak. Many of the states, though, were ahead of the federal government, which we find is fairly usual. And so many of these states were engaging in this air quality regulation update as we were going through this period. Some of the other things in air quality have to do with emissions from rigs, as well as containing, uh, containing liquids and other sorts of things coming from a rig in a liquid gathering system, rather than running it in trucks. The idea there being you reduce the truck traffic, so dust on the roads, emissions from the trucks, as well as the significant safety issue associated with large volumes of truck traffic, both in terms of road transport safety, as well, the safe, as, well as the safety of our neighbors and wildlife in certain parts of the West. This particular picture is a picture of my wheat crop from two years ago on our ranch in Colorado. The next slide is about hydraulic fracturing, which has gotten a lot of attention in the United States, and that's why the slide and this piece of conversation is part of my presentation. But I think I would have to say, based on my understanding of Ukrainian regulation, Ukraine got this right in the first instance. Instead of going through all of the conversation and re-conversation about hydraulic fracturing disclosure that has happened in some of the states in the United States. It's been Shell's principle that hydraulic fracturing fluids should be disclosed, and we've encouraged our service providers to so disclose fracturing fluids. This particular well is drilled uh, in the western part of the state of Colorado. Going back to a theme that John initially raised around transparency. One of the things that is extremely important in regulatory processes is to be open and transparent about everything that's going on in the process 
and allow people who are going to be impacted by operations to be aware of what's happening. So many states have gone to platforms on the internet where all pieces of development can be seen. So a permit application is posted on the internet. Uh, reports associated with that application and the drilling program are also posted on the internet. There are various moments for public comment and public participation. Uh, and in many locations, specific programs and specific designations for local government to participate in a unique way. Because not all citizens have time to focus this much energy on unconventional drilling. And they rely on their local government official to do that on their behalf. And so in some of the states of the United States, the state itself has recognized the importance of local governments in their representation of the community and provided them with some additional opportunities that aren't provided to the public in general. So an example of how some of, sometimes this works from, again, the state of Colorado, this particular example about protecting groundwater. So the state of Colorado came with a proposal to require companies to drill two monitor to uh, identify two existing wells and sample them to identify the groundwater quality. They then required companies to do one sample before drilling and one sample after drilling. Their particular proposal did not accommodate any memoranda of understanding or arrangement between local government and the state or operators, and it included some broad exceptions. So Shell took that proposal and set it next to our operating principles and identified that indeed our principles would require of us some additional things. In talking with other stakeholders, we found that we were not particularly aligned with our peers, other companies, but our thinking on this topic did particularly align with the Environmental Defense Fund, an NGO in the U.S. And so we and they together created a counterproposal to the regulator, including additional drilling of wells, additional post-drilling samples, and wells more in a radius around the well to have a better chance at identifying any potential issues. So what ended up happening? The regulator in Colorado wrote a regulation that increased the number of wells to be drilled, uh, sorry, to be sampled, and these are existing wells. So these are, these are water wells from farmers, these are artesian wells, these are natural springs, but existing groundwater sources that could have the potential to be impacted. They identified the areas where these wells should be drilled. They included additional areas for testing. They reduced the number of exceptions to the rule for mature fields, if you will. And they identified that where operators and local governments had come to agreements about how those communities wanted to manage groundwater, those agreements would be respected. So where is regulation going next in the United States? To a couple of places, one of them having to do with water quantity, again, one of Shell's operating principles. The idea here being the reduction of the use of fresh water and not competing with other water users for water. And thinking creatively about ways to incentivize water reuse either through taxing regimes and uh, allowing for reduction in tax for a period of time during recycling at the beginning of a project, or in non-monetary ways. If you are a water recycler, your permit goes to the front of the queue. If you're not recycling water, you wait behind those who are choosing to do so. Some of the thinking there. 
And then in terms of communities, in the eastern United States, a lot of the drilling that's happening is happening very close to people. And so when that drilling started, you also started to see an uptick in media coverage and an uptick in public sentiment about drilling. And we in the western United States were a bit taken aback about what all the fuss was about because we'd been doing this for quite a long time and were quite comfortable with living near these operations. Some of these operations now, even in the western states, are coming closer to people. And so I would observe using a, a personal story, if I may. And we can go to the last slide. So this is a picture of my ranch. And that's my older daughter on one of our horses. And that's me, and you way in the back on the other horse, on purpose so you can't actually see me. Uh, and in the back you'll see a couple of tanks, and there's a metering station there as well. So the idea is, as these operations come closer to people, you start having concerns about children, and smell, and noise, and light, and other day-to-day -day impacts of how oil and gas development will interface with families and how they work. How do children get to school on buses? And what does that bus route look like if you have all kinds of oil and gas traffic competing with the bus? So these are the topics of regulation now that local governments have identified for concern, and they're working with state governments to regulate in that space. And we'll find the next topic, and the next topic, and the next topic. Because what is true about unconventionals is, it seems to not stop changing. The technology continues to advance. We continue to do what we do more efficiently, more in a more environmentally sustainable way. And communities continue to advance their conversation and their understanding of the issues as well. So this slide is titled, Doing No Harm, which is part of Shell's safety culture, Goal Zero, doing no harm to the environment or to people. And I would add in this space also to a way of life, that the idea is to have as little interface with people as possible but where we do interface, to do it in a way that is as constructive and cooperative as we can. And in terms of regulation, the notion in the United States, the thing that I would point to to say why has why unconventionals changed the energy landscape in North America so dramatically, it's because the regulatory structure has been able to take a very robust set of oil and gas regulations and move them with an industry that moves very, very quickly. And if we can all continue to do that, we will continue to be successful in exploring this resource. In the same way, Ukraine's very robust set of oil and gas regulations are poised to respond to an unconventional business with some modification to address the things that that business needs to move quickly enough to be successful. Thank you very much. Спасибо. And I look forward to our conversation. Um, thank you very much, Krista. Yes, um, we are all uh, looking forward to our discussion, but we still have yet one more presentation to make. This is a presentation to be made. Thank you very much for an opportunity to uh, take part in this round table. Um, this is a good uh, Psyche's uh, tradition to organize uh, such round tables. Uh, talking about North American experience in this um, domain, of course, our shell guests uh, have brilliantly described uh, this um, experience. Talking about North American experience in Europe, uh, it is um, sort of um, limited uh, to Britain and Poland. Uh, 
Uh, I have decided to discuss a Polish uh, scenario. Um, it is um, the most related to our uh, experience. Besides, uh, uh, Britain has its own specificity. Uh, Poland, after all, the, is um, our neighbor, and it is a uh, um, our neighbor even in regards to technologies implemented and the oil and gas basin which is, uh, is uh, partially localized in Poland it is also localized in Ukraine as uh, for a Chevron uh, company uh, they are discussing possibility to uh, develop uh, shale gas uh, while uh, um, a, sh a shell uh, company is uh, planning uh, to uh, develop a tight uh, gas so Poland is uh, basically ahead of uh, Ukraine uh, in regards uh, to unconventional uh, deposits. Uh, the first uh, uh, well was uh, drilled there uh, in uh, the uh, uh, in in 2010. So they are a bit ahead of us. Uh, we have uh, also paid particular attention to the situation there, to the tendencies. Uh, that we can identify in Polish. NOMAS has very good and old relations with Polish think tanks beginning with the 1990s. Besides, due to my previous positions, I have good communications with all guest sector of Poland. And as a result, we have quite diversified information about actual situation in the neighboring country. In this context, uh, we have involved uh, the Polish uh, Partner Institute of uh, uh, Strategic Partners from Poland, headed by Andrzej Sikora. Uh, upon our request, uh, he provided uh, us uh, with the special overview on Polish realities. What are they like uh, today, uh, retrospectively? And, uh, our, well, his uh, work uh, was uh, accessible on the gazetters.org UA, so you can uh, download it from there. Uh, now I will present uh, a few slides, uh, understanding that we have had a good share of information uh, already. And uh, now uh, let me remind you that the Poland, uh, Poland started providing licenses at the end of 2007-2008, while the first wells were drilled in 2010. And according to the official statistics of Poland, as of August 1, 2013, a total of 198 licenses were given out to 13 subjects. Among them are with Polish companies. You can see that the Polish oil and gas company has holds most of uh, permits. Uh, also, there is a number of uh, foreign companies uh, who are the pioneers uh, who have actually brought uh, the uh, experience necessary for successful implementation of these projects in Poland. Uh, for instance, we can see Sunday on Energy, ExxonMobil, uh, Chevron. ExxonMobil is uh, today not working in Poland anymore. From the very beginning, the strategy of the uh, official Poland, of the Polish government, uh, indicated that it is necessary to organize awareness raising campaign among Polish citizens uh, because um, there was a clear understanding that um, the situation related to development of unconventional gas uh, will cause a lot of uh, unexpected outcomes for the general public. Well, let's take a look at the scheme um, uh, to the left, to the right. You can see that most of the territory of uh, um, Poland is covered by uh, the licenses uh, um, where explorations are carried out. As of uh, October this year, we can see that uh, 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 Poland have already installed 152 uh, uh, drills, um, hy uh, uh, hydraulic uh, uh, faults, uh, uh, fracturing uh, was already implemented at uh, some of them. Explorations are carried out about a uh, um, number of uh, them. 
51 um, well in Poland looks uh, absolutely impressive, but um, uh, compared to the figures given to uh, by our colleagues uh, um, in uh, presented by our colleagues from the states uh, in Pennsylvania, they have uh, over 700, 7,000 wells uh, there. So we, both we and Polish, uh, have something to look forward. But both in Ukraine and in Poland, we are still talking about the exploration stage. And in this context, we already have passed through the licensing period, and the licenses cover practically all areas of Poland. For beginning with Wejerho, closer to the Baltic Sea and Rubeshev, which is at the border with Ukraine. This is what these concessional sites look like. You can see it here. I believe these pictures speak for themselves. Uh, they uh, are sometimes uh, uh, is set uh, near the uh, settlements, uh, no apocalyptic landscapes uh, so far. Yes, what we see here is a typical industrial uh, landscape uh, at the stage of uh, uh, drilling, with a drilling facility installed. And uh, as you can see, there is nothing of extreme here. A couple of uh, more uh, pictures uh, demonstrating uh, the process uh, organized by our neighbors. Uh, same processes uh, are taking place in Ukraine. This is the photo uh, provided by the service uh, company getting ready to um, hide off fracking. Uh, in uh, Poland, uh, they already have uh, some people who are displeased, uh, but these people are rather exclusion than a rule. I'm not going to give you a detailed data collected uh, through various uh, surveys. Uh, the only uh, important uh, protest action which drew attention uh, of the general public in uh, in Poland was related to the uh, Chevron company activities in Rubeshov, uh, where due uh, to a local priest, uh, the population was engaged in, in the process. Seventy-eight percent of uh, Polish uh, population has not supported this protest organized by local priests. However, we do need to understand that there are some people displeased by uh, these technologies. Nevertheless, our Polish colleagues uh, state uh, that uh, due to well-organized uh, awareness raising campaign uh, that was organized uh, both uh, by the uh, uh, public uh, administration and uh, the uh, companies themselves. Uh, uh, the, the, the Polish citizens uh, have a general uh, good uh, and positive understanding of the offered uh, technology. Besides, uh, the uh, driver behind such positive attitude to, to shale gas uh, in accordance with the survey results with the fact uh, that the project uh, will promote uh, more intensive uh, development of uh, the region. 80% 80, 80 of Polish believe uh, that uh, uh, they also uh, see as a positive factor creation of new uh, jobs. Uh, uh, Seventy-seven percent of uh, Polish uh, uh, citizens uh, think about uh, that. Uh, besides, uh, the experts uh, will be uh, Polish uh, experts will be involved in these uh, activities. Uh, but uh, um, it is uh, possible that uh, among uh, tool uh, pushers uh, will be um, very progressive uh, Polish engineers uh, who have worked uh, abroad and who are now involved in such uh, projects. 
крепості суб, суб, суб In this uh, context, uh, of course, uh, it is uh, important to point out to the fact that the majority of uh, population of uh, Polish is uh, certain that uh, due to abidance by legal and technological regulations, uh, extraction of unconventional gas is not uh, something uh, something more threatening than uh, traditional gas extraction and development. Uh, basically, what we see uh, today is a slowing uh, down of uh, the development project in Poland. Uh, they started very fast and aggressively, but what we see today is that they slow down uh, to a certain extent. Why? Uh, Poland uh, seemed uh, to have uh, provided the most favorable regime. Uh, it is uh, very uh, loyal uh, to this uh, project. Uh, the country has a very positive approach at the social level. But nevertheless, there are some uh, problems. Uh, our Polish colleagues identified the following uh, challenges uh, that uh, now uh, are now slowing down the, the development uh, project. For instance, uh, lack of uh, of um, responsible uh, person at the governmental uh, level is uh, one of uh, such serious uh, challenges because at the level of uh, each ministry there is uh, uh, some different policy introduced. Uh, Polish citizens believe uh, that uh, uh, there, is, there are uh, no uh, uh, unified procedures introduced at the uh, state level which result in problems related to permits. Uh, for instance, um, in Canada or Canada, it takes few weeks to receive permits. In Poland, in accordance with the information provided by our certain Polish citizens, it takes uh, a year or even over a year to receive them. Of course, uh, it significantly slows down the entire process of drill development. Generally, what is surprising is in spite of the general level of foreign investments, uh, there are no uh, mechanism supporting these uh, investments. We're talking not about investments in general, but uh, we are talking about investments in unconventional gas uh, extraction. Also, uh, Polish citizens believe that the government underestimates the potential number of jobs uh, to be created through this um, uh, industry, uh, in particular through um, service uh, industry. Uh, it is also there is also a general understanding that there is a no close relation in, in between the development of local territory and the strategy of economic development of the state in general and the economic policy of the country. Uh, also, the Polish uh, believe um, that uh, there are some disadvantages um, introduced by the law on mining. However, there are a number of amendments developed, and nevertheless, they've caused quite unexpected response because they believe that these amendments will not stimulate the industry development, but will slow it down even further. That is why the investors of both uh, local investors and uh, Polish um, investors uh, slowed down uh, drilling. They have uh, planned that by the end of the year, uh, they have uh, planned to have uh, approximately 70 uh, um, operable mines, uh, but this is not uh, going to happen. The Investors are waiting for the new mining law to be adopted to see what is going to happen. Uh, besides, um, in the context of successive future uh, projects on uh, unconventional gas extraction, some people believe that the priority should be given to Polish companies. 
um, and they believe that Polish gas should be extracted by of Polish companies and foreign investors, they should simply come in to share their experience and their role should be minimized at that point. This is not the official position, though. However, such approaches do, such understanding does exist. And many people in Poland indicate that this will result in decline of this area. Poland does not have the necessary investment and production potential that would make it possible for Poland to implement this project without involvement of powerful foreign companies. That is why what we see here that there are contexts that slow it all down. We hope that they will not prevent the entire project to be implemented, but the general understanding of the situation within the Polish society will make it possible to introduce this type of industry. It is impossible to, of course, repeat American Revolution in its pure form. It is uh, possible only the way we see it in Canada or in the US. However, in the European framework, uh, it is possible to do that. Uh, however, there are uh, certain questions uh, in this regard. Uh, um, uh, the question one is whether a high potential of the deposit will be confirmed. The uh, forecasted resources, the figures are quite uh, well, we're well known, but uh, uh, whether they are a commercial, to be commercially developed, this is yet a question to answer. Uh, that's, uh, it would take approximately three years to answer the questions. So. Uh, expenses per drill will increase. The uh, expenses, uh, um, the, the, the costs uh, um, per uh, drill, uh, um, though they are explorative uh, drills, uh, I stress that once again, are twice uh, uh, of uh, the cost of their Northern American analogs. Uh, of course, uh, such a high investment costs uh, result in reduction of uh, investment attractiveness uh, of these uh, plays. Another issue is elimination of uh, absurd uh, bureaucratic uh, obstacles. Knowing the specificity of uh, operation of Polish bureaucratic machine, well, uh, Polish uh, see these issues as very serious issues. Um, they, um, for instance, refer to one or more years required to receive a permit. Or, for instance, uh, if a company has decided to, to drill a well uh, which would be uh, deeper than the uh, level established by um, the permit, they have to go through the entire process um, from the very beginning. Another problem that requires a solution is that uh, it is necessary to create the service market, uh, uh, services related to gas purification, water purification. It is also possible to say that during the last few years, uh, uh, Poland uh, made a significant uh, achievement in this regard. Uh, a number of um, service uh, Polish uh, companies uh, are uh, looking, are thinking uh, about coming to uh, Ukraine. Uh, however, the volume of this uh, market is not uh, enough uh, to. Uh, uh, to create uh, the uh, drilling of projects. Well, in Berlin, they were criticized, for instance. 
of you should have had uh, 300 uh, uh, wells instead of 30. That would be a high quality effect. Uh, that's how Polish were criticized in Berlin. However, Poland do not yet have a possibility to provide services uh, to these uh, wells. Also, we need uh, to remember that uh, the companies uh, that the state needed to make a taxation system more favorable, well, um, Foreign investors have indicated that the existing taxation system in Poland is quite favorable. What is a problem is the attempt to change the rules in the process of games. Since in Poland there is no production agreement, but there is a traditional permit system, changes in the taxation system is quite sensible for sensitive for the companies. The Companies, uh, uh, American companies, uh, managed to uh, do a shale um, gas uh, revolution because the legislative system was uh, stable. I believe, beginning with the nineteen uh, eighties, the regulatory system was uh, quite uh, stable. And uh, our Polish colleagues also believe uh, that attitudes toward investors uh, should uh, change. The investors should be regarded as uh, partners. Uh, they believe that the government sees the investors uh, uh, as uh, people who are subordinated to them. They should simply come and uh, uh, receive uh, bless their blessing to implement work and simply give uh, money to the government. And uh, the final uh, point, in spite of the fact that generally in Poland there is a positive attitude uh, toward uh, the uh, unconventional gas uh, projects. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we need to continuously talk uh, to the citizens, uh, indicating that uh, the works uh, uh, related to unconventional gas extraction and uh, hydrofracking uh, will not poison environment or water even though in Poland there are no, no real difficulties related to water supply. In this, uh, probably I should stop myself at this point. Uh, I should uh, simply remind uh, you that uh, the Polish uh, party, the Poland, uh, together with uh, Ukraine, can through implementation of large-scale uh, unconventional gas uh, projects, uh, even uh, through the most, uh, in accordance with the most pessimistic uh, evaluation, cover their own needs uh, with uh, gas resources and uh, minimize uh, uh, gas import uh, and uh, the model that we have uh, developed. We called it um, uh, methane belt uh, uh, of uh, Europe uh, scenario. So Ukraine and Poland can be the methane belt of uh, Europe. Uh, yesterday we've uh, talked uh, that uh, with the Q group and Wish group, uh, but this is one of the scenarios. Uh, to make sure that this scenario is uh, successful, it is uh, necessary to ensure synergy of actions at the governmental level to ensure general awareness of uh, the public. Uh, and uh, it is possible to achieve success uh, here by coordinating efforts of all the stakeholders. Uh, I would like to remind you of a uh, quote um, of a Stanford uh, professor who said that uh, when you compare Poland and Argentina, in Argentina they have also recently uh, started works related to shale gas, but in Argentina uh, there are 120 uh, wells uh, with hydrofracking uh, completed. Well, if the rates of actions in Poland and Ukraine will be as slow as they are, the other countries will make a history of repeating the shale gas revolution that the U.S. and Canada went through. Piotr Munzas 
recommends the Polish government to review attitude towards investors in this area. We believe unless it is done, the, the, the Polish will either fail or they will experience quite low development of the projects. Against um, the, since a number of uh, companies, uh, including Exxon Model, have already left uh, the uh, Polish uh, uh, market, nevertheless, uh, the general attitude of uh, both um, the investors, uh, internal and uh, foreign investors, uh, indicate that they believe it is necessary to continue these uh, projects. Uh, also keeping in mind that along the road we go through technological improvement. Everybody understands that this is not the prospect for the nearest future. Our Polish colleagues say that their plans is to come to certain results by 2025. Uh, it is 2025 that uh, the, that is the year when uh, Poland will be able to uh, extract uh, uh, unconventional gas uh, uh, to satisfy its industrial uh, needs uh, and uh, to come closer to such indicator as 30 uh, million cubic meters. But this is a scenario only. Only uh, the people who walk uh, master the road. In our Ukrainian experience, we also needed to keep in mind uh, Polish experience in order to change uh, some things as we go, to have a possibility to work with the American companies, uh, to keep in mind uh, that we needed to adapt to the existing situation in order to be successful. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, um, thus, we have rounded out uh, our uh, panel uh, presentations, and now we open floor for questions and answers. Um, we uh, have uh, quite emotional uh, questions um, to be posed. And uh, so, um, so now let's open floor for the questions. I will try uh, to group the questions in accordance uh, with the topics uh, covered by them. And the first uh, question is uh, to Mr. Romanov. Uh, 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 international uh, expert indicated that there are uh, 50 uh, deficiencies uh, in um, Ukrainian uh, situation that uh, make it impossible to ensure environmental uh, safety. Um, this is the first question. And uh, the second question is uh, uh, that the uh, land uh, will be extorted from the general population. Uh, how can you uh, prove that there is uh, no corruption component in the agreements? Uh, as uh, for deficiencies, uh, well, we need uh, to discuss in details uh, what are the deficiencies, uh, who indicated them. As for corruption, well, our, I would like to ask our guests, uh, please uh, take a look, uh, go look through our roundtables. Uh, if you have any proposals, if you have any remarks you would like uh, to make according uh, the, regarding the legislation or legal documents, please always indicate what, where, and what should be corrected. I believe that the experts will gladly use your proposals. As for the emotional statements, yes. 350 people who were employed, this is not enough. Well, we need to harmonize Ukrainian legislation with the international best practices. Now, the questions to Shell Company. 
Um, how do you uh, take into consideration the interest of the communities uh, uh, on uh, whose territories uh, you uh, extract uh, um, unconventional gas? Um, do the territorial communities control the company's activities uh, in the process of uh, the deposit e extraction? And question three. At whose expense uh, is monitoring, environmental monitoring implemented at the territories in order to prevent uh, um, uh, environmental emergencies? The first question on the local communities or territories. Um, in Pennsylvania, we have. Um, 2,600 municipalities or local communities that have um, their own powers, but not in the oil and gas industry. We have 67 counties, regions. Um, there have been communities um, primarily outside of the areas where drilling have taken place that have expressed concerns. The one thing that has happened, and it ties into the, the second part of the question, in Pennsylvania, um, there was an impact fee established. That impact fee is, is paid by the companies, it's provided to the state, and then that those funds are generated back to the communities where the activities are taking place. So some of our areas in the state, for example, um, an area where I grew up, it was an area that um, was primarily coal and steel, of which the ad industry basically died in the 80s. So the Marcella Shell play or the unconventionals has resurrected some of our communities. Um, the one community, for example, Cumberland Township, receives a million dollars a year in impact fees that it invests back into the communities. So setting the system to where the, the funds are generated back to where the activities has helped um, alleviate uh, community issues has helped communities you know, deal with a broad gamut of, of issues they needed to in, in dire budgetary times. As for the monitoring question, uh, the state um, regulatory programs monitor um, the drilling activities, both pre and post. Uh, and that's We have uh, numerous inspectors who actually go out on site to inspect to ensure operations are being accounted or accounted for, accountable. Um, one activity I, I just want to emphasize that the state is divided by the Department of Environmental Protection into three key operational areas. And projects have taken place to make sure all inspectors are seeing basically the same thing when they go out to inspect. So there's been combined inspections. So, uh, in addition, as to the first question about how we involve communities, uh, Shell has a quite specific set of activities that we engage in, but they are modified to accommodate the particular community. So, what works in Pinedale, Wyoming, looks different than what works in South Africa, and probably looks different than what works in Ukraine. But the idea is the same, and it involves a set of engagements in the community, local meetings, followed by participation together in public hearings that the government may sponsor, followed by setting up an opportunity for local communities to continuously engage with Shell via a telephone number, a website, and in places where telephones and the internet are not easily available, identifying a single point of contact who will be the primary contact for Shell for people to share concerns with. Within the structure then, that engagement comes into the organization and the particular technical expert who can respond to that concern is brought to the conversation to answer those questions and respond to those concerns. 
As to local communities, not all states operate like Pennsylvania does. In the western United States, there are a number of states where local communities do have jurisdiction to engage in certain kinds of limited regulatory activity having to do with zoning. So when I speak about things like traffic patterns, uh, noise, light, those sorts of issues, those would fall in a category called zoning. And local communities have an ability to regulate in that space. And as far as monitoring, as John suggested, the state runs the monitoring program. They deploy inspectors to go out and observe operations at the well location. But the monitoring itself, in terms of data, and certainly the mitigation, in terms of uh, preventing and controlling opportunities for any kind of environmental derogation are paid for by companies. Excuse me, one, 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 one small question to John. Uh, John, who, who paid for the uh, monetary activity, environment monitoring from other sphere monetary uh, the hydrocarbon producers or the state agency? In certain activities, certain activities, the state will have programs which monitor. In other situations, companies are responsible um, for their operations to provide um, the information from their own self-monitoring. Thanks. A number of questions to Psyche Center where it is possible to purchase uh, um, books. Uh, please uh, go to our website. You can find uh, all of the information uh, and uh, uh, information on how uh, it is possible to uh, subscribe uh, to our journal. Uh, what happened uh, to uh, John Sipskun? Uh, Alona Sipskun? Uh, those, uh, all the uh, guests uh, who have applied, uh, they are all uh, here. Uh, if you have uh, questions, uh, please uh, pose questions to them. And now I give the floor to Alona Miskuna. Uh, I'm going to uh, speak um, uh, Ukrainian. I can speak English, but since our uh, community is Russian speaking, I am going to pose the question in Ukrainian. Well, I have not um, a question, but um, rather a comment. Uh, my comment is uh, as follows. Uh, the problem is that our entire uh, discussion here is uh, constructed around the question that we believe uh, that uh, uh, shale um, gas extraction will result in energy independence of Ukraine, and this is the only scenario for Ukraine. Uh, the question is uh, that uh, in Ukraine there is a huge energy saving potential. Uh, Poland uh, has already achieved a certain success in that. Uh, and uh, uh, that is why they are as interested in shale gas as they are. But uh, in Ukraine, losses in heat energies is as high as 60 percent. It is seems simply necessary uh, to heat housing sector of Ukraine, and that will make it possible for us to preserve energy. Energy saving is better than energy station. And this is my uh, question, actually. Uh, do you know uh, how much uh, GDP is um, provided uh, as a dotation to produce uh, coal? Uh, how, how, uh, how, how big uh, subsidies uh, will be provided to uh, extract uh, shale gas? If uh, this uh, uh, subsidies um, that are paid by a tax user uh, be directed at energy saving. Wouldn't it not uh, have the best, better result? Because when we um, preserve uh, energy, we then preserve the resources to be used later. And only after we introduce these energy saving technologies, we, after that, we probably should think about shale gas. Our American colleagues. Uh, uh, have uh, talked about improvement of uh, the uh, U.S. legislation. It is nice to hear, but before uh, that, uh, we were told uh, that uh, we have already uh, good regulation. But uh, it turned out that uh, 
there are uh, grounds for improvement even in this state, um, in the uh, country where the shale gas extraction was uh, developed. So we can discuss uh, that the industry is developing that fast, that the legislation has uh, to um, go along with it um, to make sure uh, it uh, covers uh, fully this area. As uh, for the Ukrainian legislation, we see a different uh, process. Our legislation is quite strong when it comes to the environment, but we have the reverse process. We simplify the process of land allocation. We simplify norms regulating participation of the community in order to facilitate shale gas extraction. We, what we do is the process can which contradicts the American experience. So probably we needed to take a look at their experience. They tighten their legislation while we um, make it more relaxed. And I have a very specific question. I have went to the state to learn the experience in this area, and I was really interested uh, how is disposal of, of, of frack of water is uh, utilized and disposed. Um, it is uh, usually uh, pumped uh, into the uh, deposit uh, wells. So I wanted to ask you whether the same very approach will be used in Ukraine, and if so, in which region, how it will be regulated, who will monitor that, uh, how will this process uh, take place? Um, we are here uh, talking the process of um, shale gas extraction. We discuss the myths. We indicate that this is safe, that there are no um, problems, no spills. Uh, and uh, people, it is not clear what people protest against, uh, but uh, extraction of even conventional oil and gas uh, development. Uh, the territory around uh, tell you a lot in regards uh, to legislation. I believe uh, that what you are saying here is unjust. You have been talking about tendencies in the law. I hope uh, that uh, you are well aware with the environmental legislation which uh, is, is in, enforced in Ukraine and with a new law draft. And I hope that you are aware of the fact that uh, documents, uh, uh, it takes approximately one year to receive a permit in Ukraine and you have heard how much it takes uh, to go uh, to, to receive permit in the state uh, please uh, tell me exactly where we regress when it comes uh, to the legal frame framework uh, as uh, for participation of the general public for instance uh, not a single company whether it communicates with the citizens more or less uh, they do not want to work in the areas uh, where they are not accepted uh, by the citizens we have a good relations with the local communities. We have a special of the people who work at the sites. The director of our company personally comes, so people have direct access to our top management. We have opened a hotline where people can pose any questions. But let's go back to the legislation. Our legislation compared to uh, other uh, foreign legislation, because I uh, have been working not only with the Ukrainian legislation, but I have also learned uh, uh, Ukrainian, uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, law, Canadian law. Our um, legal system is very prescriptive. It describes every single step that you needed to take uh, in the drilling process, for instance. It is quite strong. You have uh, talked about energy uh, preservation. You have to, uh, gas extraction is not only burning of gas. Uh, a gas extraction does not contradict uh, other state uh, measures or other state or economic priorities. Uh, the next uh, point. Uh, I hope. Uh, 
that you could have had an opportunity to visit our drills and our wells and you could see the standards that we um, apply here and I personally was impressed by our uh, operation and I believe it is totally unfair when you have been talking about the state uh, subsidies for instance we do not receive uh, uh, any funds uh, from the state we invest in Ukraine well, um, our projects are investments in, in, in the country, and we do not receive any subsidies whatsoever. But um, you have also recall, talked about some deficiencies of the law. If you have any specific priorities, well, we also do uh, read uh, the uh, various reports produced in the country, and I have I've seen very few reports uh, providing any specific uh, uh, suggestions, um, article by article, provision by provision. A very short comment in regards to energy efficiency. You are correct. We needed to have a priority. All the state officials, they do support energy efficiency. But we cannot stop still. We needed to develop in different areas. That is why development of gas plays uh, keeping in mind that gas is a very important resource is a progressive step. As for energy efficiency, this is not the topic of our today's discussion. It is possible to organize yet another round table to discuss the topic of energy efficiency. Anna Klitschuk and Alexander Semyonovich uh, uh, have been working uh, on energy-related uh, legislation, and uh, I have been responsible for the development on energy efficiency uh, law, on uh, mining law, oil and uh, gas law. Well, Ukraine is, yes, it is not the state. Uh, when something uh, happens, something serious uh, happens, uh, the uh, general uh, public uh, uh, well uh, they uh, are inactive uh, for for in at least for once uh, you should move uh, forward you should be active you are active only we uh, when we are discussing some major uh, projects well you are the representative of the general public we have organized a special conference on these issues. It is very important not only to criticize, but to help us work. That is why there is such an attitude toward the general public. Don't you think the US experts do? Don't you think that the American experts do a company regarding uh, disposal of uh, the waste waters? Uh, well, you are probably aware that there are different approaches um, to disposal of such waters. Uh, and it can be recycled. It uh, could uh, be uh, disposed of uh, differently. As of uh, today, we have not uh, yet uh, um, such uh, operations. That is why it is too early to talk about it. But there are a whole range of uh, technologies. Uh, well, the problem is uh, the entire audience um, who is listening and watching uh, us uh, via internet, they are interested only in this issue and they will not be satisfied by your answer. You've said that there is a whole range of uh, uh, recycling methods. What will be technically implemented in Ukraine? This is the answer um, expected uh, by our audience. Um, so what at this point in the project we believe to be the solution that will be deployed in Ukraine. In the United States, it is the case that it's dependent on several factors. Factor one, what is technically possible in the reservoir? Factor two, what is the regulatory regime for water reuse? 
surface disposal, underground disposal, or some of the other suite of techniques. And factor three, not in this, and they're not in this order particularly, is, is there a particular desire on the part of the community to have one of the technically feasible methods deployed? So for example, in the state of Pennsylvania, John described 83,000 miles of stream. In my state of Colorado, we are in extreme drought. So what would work in Pennsylvania will certainly not work for communities in Colorado. And so there is, I, I'm, I'm sorry to say, the answer is it depends. Because it depends on what is technically feasible and what are the community desires. And at the end of the day, the solution has to be cost effective as well. So. As to the specific project in Ukraine, I will at Oleg respond with what we think at this point some of those solutions might look like. But when we look at the science and we look at the facts, sometimes the answer isn't A or B, broadly speaking. It's A here and it's B there. And Shell's response to which we choose is dependent on some of the factors that I described. Ole? Krista was absolutely correct. It depends on the stage of your project and the scale of your project. For instance, in Canada, when we have a lot of wells, we have, I'm talking about our activities in Canada, you can construct a plant to recycle and purify the water, and you even can provide certain services to our companies. Since I am an advisor on regulatory issues, um, I can tell you um, if you have a small project, if your well is uh, nearby, you can use this uh, water again. You can take it to another uh, well. You will purify it for, for the needs of uh, the other well and you will reuse it but it really depends on uh, your project on your situation but as we have already said we have not yet had uh, hydrofracking uh, it is uh, clear that uh, the water cannot be deposited without purification. It is uh, necessary to, uh, to to abide by the existing normatives, uh, norms uh, of uh, pollution, and uh, uh, in order to. Uh, uh, pump uh, this water into uh, a special uh, well, you need to have special permit uh, too. And you need to have all the necessary environmental permits too. This is what I can uh, tell you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, what uh, what resources do you refer to when you um, describe uh, the percentage uh, rate uh, in uh, Poland, pro or against uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, shale gas? Uh, you can uh, take uh, in this information from our website. Uh, I have been referring to SMG, uh, sociological uh, survey, and the other uh, sociological review uh, organized by BBS Polska. Uh, PBS SOP, um, I, I apologize. Magdalena Janskman uh, has uh, officially presented it. She is uh, the employee of um, this uh, agency, PBS SOP. And if we take a look at the first uh, source, uh, it, you can find it uh, at Lubke Polski PL. As for the question raised by Alona, I always like her questions. Even though she conceptually tries to push through opposite approaches. But I do like your questions. There is not a single contradiction in between a need to introduce energy efficiency, energy safety, and having a 
home production or for energy resources. These are two issues. Um, they exist uh, simultaneously. This is an artificial juxtaposition, especially since uh, the more energy resources we produce ourselves, uh, uh, the more uh, we reduce the uh, import of expensive Russian gas. Now, as for issues um, related to um, um, utilization of water and uh, pumping and injecting this uh, water, uh, until we study the geology of a particular region, we cannot even talk about inje water injection, because of only after the a geological study, we will have a clear understanding whether it is possible to do it or not. Because, for instance, you know um, the Lancashire exp experience. Um, after the situation was studied, it turned out that uh, the problem was related to water utilization. Uh, and uh, uh, this particular uh, location uh, community has uh, stopped uh, using that particular uh, type of water utilization. In uh, some areas, it is possible to use uh, water injection. For instance, in some areas in Canada or in states, it is possible to do that. But uh, you um, can ask uh, as many representatives of the Shell company as you'd like to. It is objective uh, situation that they cannot provide you an answer. And in my, my final remark regarding legislation, it is uh, quite uh, difficult to discuss uh, improvement of uh, legislation. If, if, for instance, uh, we, uh, you yourself uh, uh, would, uh, would say that this uh, law on conventional gas, uh, it is not applicable. It was not applicable to U Ukraine even as uh, um, recently as 2008. In this uh, regard, Polish example is um, quite uh, interesting. Uh, today, uh, having certain period, uh, having passed through a certain stage, uh, of uh, uh, improving the uh, legislation, of introducing certain operations, they have went into the next uh, process of improvement of the legislation. And we believe um, that uh, later, as we created the uh, new law draft, uh, we will uh, more discuss uh, certain potential uh, uh, costs uh, that will be received by Ukraine uh, due uh, to production agreement. Uh, we have made a proposal. Uh, we have uh, suggested and uh, provided a number of law drafts uh, in this area. We believe that our conceptual approach uh, that the uh, profits uh, that will be received by the state later if these projects are successful should not be directed into the budget because in budget there are always problems there are always people who are interested in trying to make use of these funds that is why we are trying to bring it all into order. For instance, the uh, Polish uh, party, they have um, also uh, made uh, certain uh, amendments to the law and they have uh, established the generational fund. In the US, uh, they are also discussing a possibility to create a similar uh, fund using the uh, successful Norway experience as an example. And so probably you and your organization, um, you can make your own proposals. I would not uh, I would not imagine that the parliament uh, will uh, immediately implement uh, all the law drafts, but I believe this should be a part of the public discussion because all of these uh, problematic issues uh, are related to, to direction of certain funds, including minimization of potential risks. 
Там складне питання в цьому контексті, тому що ви знаєте, я зіштовхнувся з цим на And in Poland. Is it also possible in Poland to exploit anybody's land share to extract shale gas? Well, it is quite a difficult question. I have faced this problem when we have discussed issues related to land provision for a pipeline Brodetrotska in Poland. This is a really difficult question. And yes, it was it was traditionally difficult a situation. I would not be ready to answer your uh, uh, question anonymously, but the general attitude of the Polish society and owners uh, of a certain land shares, uh, they uh, support uh, this uh, process. Uh, it is. I would not rush into saying that this process would be painless, uh, but during the last uh, three years, uh, there were practically no conflicts related to land use and land allocation. But this is the specificity of Poland. This is a difficult question for them traditionally, but it is possible to um, respond to that issue for the benefit of the state and uh, uh, the citizens. Are you planning to involve uh, uh, people uh, a representative of the countries who have banned hydro fracturing in their countries. Our open table is open to any to any viewpoints. That is why we have a video and internet translation in Russian and English. And I believe that our audience is not quite fair. Yes, we are ready to be open. If you are a scientific community, why have you brought PR managers, not the scientists? Um, because, uh, and the comment to this question is that uh, Psychea is uh, really thankful to Shell Company. Yes, uh, it is uh, my comment that uh, Psychea is thankful to uh, Shell Company because uh, the Shell Company was. Uh, the, is the company who is ready to meet with the general public and the scientists. As uh, for organization of a round table with the uh, scientific uh, community and uh, the companies involved in the geological uh, surveillance, this was the round table, the, the previous round table. Shell company has not taken part in that round table. Those who are interested in answers um, to your questions, uh, please uh, go to our website. Um, uh, you can find uh, full entire materials of our previous round table there. Uh, have uh, our American uh, guests uh, visited Yusuf uh, Square? Are you satisfied uh, with the uh, quality of uh, roads? Uh, can uh, they uh, survive uh, the uh, traffic load? Well, you don't have to go to Yusuf uh, Square. All roads in Ukraine are in quite poor shape. This is the overall problem. Question to the Shell Company. Is uh, the uh, state uh, legislation uh, provides uh, for uh, a provision of uh, certain benefits that is uh, to be directed to uh, the uh, development of uh, the explored th territories. So it depends. And I'll ask John to talk specifically about the Pennsylvania example. In other parts of the United States, it's done through a couple of different regimes. One of them is a taxing regime, whereby the state collects a set of taxes on its own behalf and on behalf of local governments. They have specific names. But in essence, the notion is the state collects the tax on production and reverts some of that money back to local communities. The other regime is a regime whereby local governments who have jurisdiction to regulate, as we discussed earlier, in the zoning space will, in order to execute on those regulations, charge a fee to secure those permits. 
and by so doing, create some funds for local government. The other tool that gets used, not as often in the United States and not specifically in the unconventional space, is the notion of creating partnerships with communities, whereby communities become partial owners with companies and government in the production that's coming from that community. Again, that's not in the unconventional space, and it's an example that's fairly specific to a couple of different kinds of development in the United States. So generally speaking, the most common approach is the first approach I discussed, taxation collected by the state and sent out then to local communities for them to use for things like lo local impacts on roads, bridges, infrastructure, etc. Pennsylvania has taken a slightly different approach. I'll ask John to describe that. Pennsylvania's approach has been an impact fee, um, as opposed to leveraging a severance tax across the industry. The state chose to do an impact fee where the funds that are collected by the amount of drilling taking place in a particular community are collected by the state but re-diverted back to that community. So it's based on a percentage. And again, I use an example of one of our communities who has received about a million dollars uh, to their budget uh, for this local community. So as Krista said, there's, there's the broader taxing or severance tax, but Pennsylvania has chose this impact fee and it has turned out to be a benefit to those communities where activities are taking place because they have control of the funds and they make the decision as opposed to the state where those funds go for their own communities. Uh, please uh, cover the situation on uh, uh, Bilaevsk uh, 400 and uh, the uh, question on uh, Bilaevsk uh, 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 and uh, is uh, a shell uh, trying to hide information again, uh, especially when it talks uh, when it comes uh, to Grigolevska uh, Chitista? How uh, will you utilize uh, the frack waters? Um, again, it is very difficult for me to comment uh, this question because I'm not a part of the uh, geology. Uh, what I am saying in no way contradicts the truth. Yes, we are preparing the hydrofaxing, but it has not yet taken place. Don't think that immediately after we have it, uh, we will need uh, we will dispose of water because we need to wait for some time for water to go up it has to stay there for uh, some time so this question is not um, a question to be answered in the course of one month or a few months yes we are planning uh, to uh, do hydraulic fracturing but it has not yet been done so it is too early to discuss that question as for technology, use of uh, pizza um, um, is prohibited in uh, the Netherlands. Why are you planning to use that in Ukraine? I uh, unfortunately I'm not aware of what that is. I'm also I, I also don't know what that is. So their use uh, is uh, prohibited in the Netherlands. Why are you planning to use uh, the pit principle in Ukraine? The wells uh, that I have uh, visited in which Bilivska, uh, they are getting ready. They are preparing pizza. They are open type of pizza because of the chemicals that uh, will be used. Well, there there will not be chemicals used uh, during the drilling process. Those be uh, water based uh, uh, materials. As far as Bilavska 400, uh, we do have the pizza there, in order to preserve was uh, to store water uh, there after the um, hydro uh, factoring it is insulate it is double iron insulated uh, in accordance with the Ukrainian law all of this uh, technology has uh, uh, been assessed and we have received positive environmental uh, permits um, Vladimir Bezin, uh, as a for North America uh, uh, 
people, um, everything that is uh, usually, uh, everything that is uh, said uh, um, by the Shell company is uh, generally perceived uh, as a part of uh, governmental corrupt uh, schemes. Uh, why wouldn't you organize a video conference uh, with the people who actually live there, who actually live in the communities uh, where uh, uh, drilling, uh, where such type of drilling is uh, done? If uh, Shell uh, has uh, uh, no uh, long-term experience, uh, well, uh, what's the point of discussing that? And then um, the question is uh, whether uh, maybe it is possible to organize a Skype conference uh, with the, uh, the people representing other territories developed by other companies. Uh, so what do you think about Skype conference with the uh, population from this side? So, a very brief comment. Uh, please uh, show uh, us other company which so openly works in Ukraine, which uh, takes part in the roundtables in public discussions as often as we do. This is the only comment. Uh, as far as I can remember, uh, Shell works with a Pindell um, deposit since uh, 2001. So. Uh, probably uh, this is uh, quite a significant experience uh, over 12 uh, years, especially we talk uh, about thick gas uh, there in Pinedale. So I would actually just observe that in the U.S. we have done uh, yeah. exactly that. We have done video conferences among various shell communities to have conversations on specific shell topics or in response to particular shell videos, et cetera, but we have actually done precisely that. So. Whether uh, the shell is going to use its nihilistic approach to working with the local communities in Ukraine too. How we are actually working with the local communities here in Ukraine. In accordance with the law, we organize public hearings. We have opened a hotline, free of charge hotline for the general public through which we can pose any questions that are of interest. Our representatives regularly go to Kharkiv and the Donetsk region to communicate with the local communities. All heads of the uh, village uh, communities uh, have uh, uh, direct uh, uh, telephone lines uh, with our representatives. So the communication that has been established is uh, quite efficient. We organize a lot of round tables. Uh, uh, we answer any questions posed to us by the general public. It is this experience that actually exists in Ukraine. Uh, thank you very much. Galina Alenik, Open Letter of the Open Society Institutes of Ukraine, uh, Second uh, Public Council at uh, the Environmental um, uh, Ministry of Ukraine. The letter is quite big, uh, and uh, we will gladly use it in our further activities. The question is as follows. Uh, we have already exhausted our uh, time frame, which uh, concerns me and it makes me happy at the same time. I am happy that we have had so many questions, but I am worried uh, that with each moment there are more and more questions that we will not be able to answer due to time limitations. So there is a, a the following question, high uh, exhaustion rates of the deposits uh, will uh, reduce uh, the um, total uh, amount of uh, oil available. Uh, we are, are concerned that uh, these uh, countries will not be able uh, to uh, repeat, to, to go along uh, the uh, American Revolution. Uh, um, the, the direct uh, quote, uh, uh, there is uh, no lack of uh, oil uh, and uh, demand for oil to grow uh, to, uh, to a differentiation between uh, use of uh, oil throughout the world. Well, this is an interesting question. Today, there are 7 billion uh, of people here. In the mid-21st century, we will have 9 billion uh, of people on the planet. The more uh, 
because people are living uh, here, the more energy resources we need. Because people who uh, are born in Africa or in China, they wanted to feel comfortably in, uh, in regards to energy. Uh, Alona uh, is a great supporter of environment, and this is good. Uh, where uh, should uh, we sh could uh, extract uh, uh, gas uh, uh, at the shelf uh, area? We could uh, extract uh, traditional gas, uh, which is methane. Here uh, we can also we need to also think about the following when we make a choice what is more environmentally safe uh, where we can uh, get energy resource uh, in a more ecologically safe ma manner Arctic approach is a risky one so it is probably better to use uh, uh, unconventional hydrocarbon hybrid uh, approach a second point to keep in mind is the following. The OPEC uh, countries uh, are somewhat nervous because the global hydrocarbon uh, market is becoming more and more competitive. Higher competence means lower price. Um, example of Northern European gas uh, market is brilliant. Nobody wants uh, to lose uh, income. So OPEC is uh, developing a number of uh, measures uh, to slow down uh, entrance uh, of uh, new volumes of unconventional oil and gas into the global market. Um, there are grounds uh, to believe that because uh, as a cost uh, of uh, extraction of unconventional uh, conventional gas and oil is double of uh, the conventional. And uh, in this regard, uh, they uh, might uh, uh, trying and uh, using a price uh, reduction to uh, make uh, uh, unconventional oil and gas extraction uh, unprofitable. But uh, each uh, company wants uh, somebody else to do that. And for instance, uh, Saudi Arabia wants to preserve uh, its uh, income. In this regard, uh, uh, unconventional hydrocarbons for us as the consumers uh, will stimulate competition, which is very important. And that is why when we begin if we enter uh, this market, uh, the, then we will need to discuss uh, maximum uh, safe modern technologies uh, and we will need certain investments. Only major companies can afford investments. So uh, there is uh, some uh, logic behind this uh, process and uh, the uh, solutions, the decisions that have been taken today to involve major investors are logical as far as I can understand. Well, I would like to point out the following. Um, Nine billion people, new energy resources. This is the question that will arise. But your solution is to find additional resources where they have not yet been extracted before. But at the same time, we also need to remember that now, right now, now, there are climatic uh, session taking place in Warsaw. And the country is again uh, discussing the uh, opportunities to reduce uh, uh, pollution. And in order to avoid a tragic climate change, thanks to which entire Ukraine up to Poltava will be covered with water, in order to avoid that, all of the all the hydrocarbon resources have to stay there in the ground. So, in order to cover uh, these two extra billion um, people. Uh, and in order to do that, we needed to get as much uh, resources as uh, possible from land. Uh, then uh, we will have no earth to live on. Well, in general, I have uh, talked to you. Your, uh, but there is your perspective 
We either take uh, resources from Earth or we don't. We are either flooded or not. We need to think uh, rationally. Methane does not produce uh, um, carbon emissions. It is cool that results in CO2 or oil. In this context, what we are talking about, let's take a look at the statistics of the US. The curve has dropped in regards to CO2 after they stopped, after they began burning less coal and more gas. It is available at the Environment Protection Agency. This is an answer to your question. In general, I do agree with you. We need to take less. But you need to understand that the inertia that has been built through the centuries, it cannot be stopped in at one moment. This is the actual reality. So after, um, I believe that uh, Shell gets an uh, era, it also be filled uh, in uh, by a uh, production of methane. We are coming close to that, but we are technological and not ready to that. Uh, I believe uh, this is a way out. Uh, nature is uh, smarter than uh, people. And at certain point, it makes it uh, possible to create uh, technologies uh, that at first uh, look uh, seem problematic, but are later improved. Thank you very much. We are coming uh, closer to an end. Uh, is it, uh, it is not really uh, uh, sensible to uh, speak uh, about uh, uh, future prospects and maximum uh, scenario uh, for extraction of uh, this uh, gas. Andrei Palyuva, Chernomorneyevty gas. When we talk about Ukraine, of course, uh, we need to pay attention not only to uh, unconventional energy carriers, but the conventional to our company extracts gas in the Black Sea, but we cannot focus only on one approach. We needed to have a portfolio including both unconventional and conventional products. And there is, a, and it is okay to buy resources from other countries too through beneficial contracts. I cannot hear the question through the microphone. Could you please bring the speaker's microphone closer to him? Um, well, this is a rather specific question. Our company is not doing hydraulic fracturing at the shelf, so it is very difficult to answer that question. Are you planning to do that in the nearest future? No, our company does not plan to do that. I have a lot of questions to pose, but we have been working for three hours in a row here instead of two and a half, and I would like to express our gratitude to our experts for the efforts they've made to satisfy our audience. On our part, we will generalize what has been said here today, and we will direct uh, this uh, information to the Shell company to make sure that our audience uh, gets uh, all of the answers to all of the questions. At this point, uh, I would like to round up the round table. Thank you very much.